you know, this, if you, you've never watched me before or, or, or are not familiar, this is the uh, the Ricky reading series, which is a Sunday stream series that I've been doing for what, the past five weeks now, six weeks now, where I have been reading this book by <clears throat> Jenny O'Dell. Is it Jenny O'Dell? Off the top of my head, I don't have the book in front of me. And it's a book called How to Do Nothing, Escape, like, Resisting the Attention Economy. And so we've gone through week by week, going from chapter to chapter, talking about the different themes that come up in the reading. And then, you know, I have uh, my real life background as a doctor of social psychology. So I decided that I wanted to also, you know, pull in a little bit of that as well to kind of flush out the reading. So we've talked about sort of the history of labor movements in America. We've talked about social media algorithms. We've talked about sort of some postmodernism in there, as well as like political theory and anti-capitalism and what is capitalism and what is uh, neoliberalism and all kinds of different things. And so this is sort of, this is going to be the finale. We're going to be talking about the last chapter, which is called Restoring the Grounds for Thought and the conclusion. So I think these two really rhyme together very well. They are, um, they feel very much like kind of a, a winding thesis statement at times, trying to get to this, this question in the title, how do you do nothing? We live in this world where we are sort of inundated with information that's far too much than we can ever like we can process at any given time. So what do we do actually do about it? We are going to learn. We are going to learn how to do nothing, Mercury. All right. So um, if you could uh, hold on to your butts, there's going to be some some fun stuff here. Some topics that I, I'm going to try my best to handle. I might not do the best, but there's um, I'm not perfect. I'm just a VTuber which is as close to perfect as a person can get, but still so far. All right, let's get it started. So recapping what we've learned up until this point. So last week we really talked about what is a society. So we got into sort of uh, neoliberal economics. We talked specifically about Thatcherism and Margaret Thatcher's famous, famous line that there is no such thing as a society, which I'm sure Odell would object to and I also object to. And so we try to describe what what is a society let me get the uh, let me get the doker remote in there in the chat so it's important culture right there all right there we go there's the doker we do live in a society and so what is a society actually formed out of it's created out of a combination of attention and time so there's uh there are some historical models and sociological models that talk about you know what where do we really get this idea of society from and a lot of thinkers would tell you that it comes from the shift from a hunter-gatherer society to an agricultural society. And so shifting to agriculture and growing crops meant that people were in the same space for longer periods of time, which facilitated deeper and longer lasting relationships, which has meant in time, like by attending to sharing tasks, sharing space, created what we call society. That is a shared understanding of history, of norms, of, and so on and so forth. And kind of pulling into this is that by extending our attention outward as well, so instead of getting kind of stuck in the uh, with the blinders on as if you were a racehorse or a, a horse girl, as it were, by really making the effort to step outside of ourselves, we can find connections in places that might otherwise be frustrating. So the example that Odell uses is uh, a line from David Foster Wallace talking about going to the grocery store after work when he's tired and realizing that this sucks and he doesn't want to be there, but then taking a moment to stop and consider that probably everybody in the store doesn't want to be there either, and then that there's a, a sense of solidarity that comes out of that. And as a flip side, I use the example of getting stuck in rush hour traffic and maybe you roll down your window and you realize that the person maybe a couple cars over from you is listening to the same radio station. And so by attending to and extending our attention outward, we can actually find connections in places that might otherwise seem like a desert of social interaction. So this is the uh, exciting conclusion, like I said. And so what we're going to talk about is the importance of context, both historical context, temporal context, and the way that the attention economy makes money from stripping context from information. We're also going to learn, like I said, the important answer of how do we actually do nothing. It's been weeks and weeks, and finally I think I have a satellite answer for this, but we will see how uh, things all work out. And we're also going to get into some conspiracy theories. I think that's um, an important bit of culture that I think has been missing from this channel for a while. I've decided... Mm. To become a conspiracy theorist VTuber, I think that's a niche that 
is not really well represented in the community right now. There's idols, there's comedians, but um, I'm going to wrap my hat in tinfoil and become a full-on conspiracy theorist for a while here. So uh, sit tight for that. It's an it's a exciting new pivot for my brand. So first, oh gosh, tinfoil witch hat, that would be good. I wonder, mm, I think I know exactly how to make that happen. All right, I can think that's going to be a project for another day. All right, but for now, it's it's going to be great. All right, so first, what are we going to talk about? We're really going to talk about Q. It's the letter Q. It's a it's a letter, but um, in the, in the last couple of years, if you're like me and you listen to a lot of podcasts, this uh this letter in particular has become um kind of terrifying actually, and particularly I want to talk about QAnon, which is a uh, this is hard to explain. I've listened to many, many podcasts, so it makes sense to me, but I realize whenever I try to break this down and talk about it, it's very hard to talk about. QAnon is an online, principally online conspiracy theory that has destroyed the lives of thousands of people. That's really the, the long short, if I would have put it in any blurb. It is posited with the idea that there is a government official that was posting secret information on 4chan under the name Q, which was derived from the fact that this person in the story has a uh, top level Q clearance and they are spinning the story that there is a secret war against the deep state, um, which is a cabal of elites that are controlling the world and that Donald Trump is the uh the 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 uh the god emperor basically uh that he is fighting against the deep state and there are there are black hats who are evil people and then there are white hats in the government who are on the side of trump and they're fighting against uh hillary and the the, the sickos of the deep state and that's it's the, the premise of QAnon. There's, it goes so much deeper than that um if you've ever like i don't but i don't need to talk about adrenochrome on this stream Basically, I, I want to give you guys kind of a, a tidbit of this. If you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend the podcast QAnon Anonymous, which is uh, has been on this beat for many for years at this point, and really detailing the ways that this conspiracy theory has grown, transitioned, warped, moved from 4chan to 8chan, um, really discovered who Q actually is. Turns out it's all a hoax, but it hasn't stopped this conspiracy theory from catching and destroying people's lives. Um, but anyway, um, it principally the, the, the conspiracy is constructed by Q drops, which were ostensibly these bits and pieces of cryptic information that were posted again onto 4chan of all places where no one has ever lied before and no one has ever extended the truth, like stretched the truth or cooked up a series of elaborate hoaxes you know, the noted website where everyone is honest all the time, especially when they say they want to be the little girl. That one was actually real. But <laughs> so what are the Q drops? These cryptic messages then go into the community. Uh, they're called crumbs since they are so cryptic and they are very difficult to interpret. And those go to members of this community that call themselves bakers. So they take the crumbs and they bake the bread, which is not even how bread works. You have to make dough and you've got to prove it, but you know, it doesn't happen. So what does this actually look like in practice? Uh, there are apps and stuff. This is very difficult. I feel like I'm, you know, vomiting out of fire hose. Yeah, they make shitty bread from crumbs. That's what happens. But they take stuff like this. Um, I'm going to use my conspiracy theory voice for this one. So... <clears throat> Bonus and JFK Jr. Relationship. Plane crash. 1999. HRC Senate. 2000. The start. Enjoy the show. <coughs> Q. Or boom, 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 boom. Also known as POD lyrics. A week to remember. Dark to light. Blackout necessary. Q. And missile, missile, box three. Splash. As the world turns. Red October. Q. So all these... All these, they don't mean anything, right? They're just decontextualized information. But this community that built up around Q, that probably started as, um, oh, the, the uh, like, <clears throat> Otacon, 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 Metal Gear, Missile, Missile, Fox 3, Splash, As the World Turns, Red October, Q. Um, uh, these, these don't mean anything. 
right? They're, they're just conspiracy drivel. This is the product of somebody throwing words uh, at a dartboard on 4chan and then other Anons playing along with it. But then this caught fire. It merged into this whole culture. And then suddenly Peepaw is talking about how the deep state is trying to destroy America. So none of this makes sense, right? None of those, like, none of those Q drops, so to speak, have any real meaning. But there has been an emergence of influencers in this spot, including people that are in the millions of followers. They make VTubers look small. Even the biggest VTubers look small in comparison to some of these QAnon influencers, which is frightening when you consider how big, influ and, big and influential some VTubers are. But the conspiracy culture that emerged around them, like, around these Q drops, is baffling. And I think really can only have emerged out of the attention economy because when we're derived, deprived of context, people tend to try to create or find meaning. And when you consider all the things we've talked about leading up to this point, looking at sort of the decontextualization of information, the atomization of people, what we start to get into is that we are social creatures who have now found ourselves in a situation where, well, we seek context, we seek connection, and we find it in places that maybe sometimes don't necessarily have our best interests in mind. And that's what I, I what I, when I was thinking about some of the passages in this book, this really came up to my mind in QAnon in particular, and how the influencer culture that has emerged around it, where people are making lots of money on Patreon, et cetera, really just playing into this and feeding really more content, more information, just cooking up some kind of context to pull more people in. And it's really caused a lot of real harm to other people. So uh, pivoting to a, a slightly uh, <laughs> a slightly lighter subject, uh, Barnum and Bailey, you might be familiar with as from the uh, Barnum and Bailey's circus. If you're around my age, maybe you even attended some of these shows. But they were uh, famous carnival barkers back back in the day, and P.T. Barnum in particular is famous for one in particular, one quote in particular, and has had a lasting impact on social psychology mostly because of this. There's a sucker born every minute. So back in the day, there really wasn't such a thing as fact checking, and so carnival barkers were notorious for basically cooking up and playing with early forms of the attention economy in order to really sell whatever shows or whatever attractions they had and were in many cases willing to do illegal or borderline illegal things to do so. And that has been immortalized in the field of social psychology with what we call the P.T. Barnum effect. So I'm going to, let's see if I can get this over. I might actually have to do the same thing again, but give me a one a second to see if I can get this to work. I know this is historically not worked super great. Let me know if you get sound. Oh, come on. I'm assuming there's no sound. I'm trying to get this to work out. Yeah, I'm figuring you, you do not hear. Let's see if I can. No sound? That's what I figured was going to happen. All right, we're going to we're going to do it live. Give me one second here. I'm going to switch this one of my audio sources over to the default and you should hear it now. Really? Come on. I can see it on my end that it's not working. Oh, that's why. All right. Um love technical difficulties. It's my favorite thing. It's all a part of VTuber culture. Nothing ever works like it should. Seriously? Not even then? All right. There we go. Okay, got it. The Barnum Effect describes the tendency for people to accept generalized personality descriptions as accurate descriptions of their own unique personality. In a famous experiment, psychologist Bertram Forer asked 39 of his students to take the Diagnostic Interest Blank Test. Following the test, each student received an individual personality sketch based on their test results. 
and were asked to rate on a scale of 0 to 5 how accurately it revealed basic characteristics of their personality. They were also asked to rate how effective they thought the test was in revealing personality. The students were convinced. They gave their personality sketches an average accuracy rating of 4.26, while scoring the effectiveness of the test an average of 4.31. What the students didn't know, however, was that they all received exactly the same personality sketch. Ah, suckers! Not only were they all the same, but Fora had taken the statements within the sketch from a newsstand astrology book and had absolutely no correlation with the students' test results. <laughs> they included statements such as, you have a great need for other people to like and admire you, you have a tendency to be critical of yourself, and you pride yourself as an independent thinker and do not accept others' statements without satisfactory proof. The These are Barnum statements, statements which are vague true for most people and often describe positive, desirable qualities which almost anyone can relate to. Fora's experiment was concerned with the validity of personality assessments, but the Barnum effect is equally relevant in understanding beliefs in astrology and horoscopes. Here is my actual daily horoscope I found online. See how it uses vague statements, which leaves the reader to fill in the blanks with their own meaning. It also ends on a positive note, another typical trait of Barnum's statements. Romantic news! This may all seem obvious, but horoscopes are big business and can influence people mm -hmm. into making mm -hmm. poor decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if we understand why we fall victim to the Barnum effect, maybe we can be better at avoiding it. In a 1972 study, Snyder and Larson told one group of test subjects that their personality sketch was created specifically for them, and a second group was told that their sketch was generally true of people. Those who had received the personality sketches labelled specifically for them rated them as being a more accurate description of their own personalities compared with the generally true group. In another study, test subjects were presented with 12 sun sign personality descriptions is real. and asked to choose the four which best matched their personality. When the descriptions were merely numbered, the test subjects had no tendency to pick the description which matched their own sun sign. However, when the descriptions were labelled with star signs, subjects were more likely to pick the description which matched with their star sign. A study by Norman Sundberg presented subjects with two different personality sketches, a genuine one and a fake one made up of Barnum statements. The Barnum sketches had five times as many socially desirable statements compared with the genuine sketches. The test subjects were asked to rate the accuracy of the two personality sketches, with 59% rating the Barnum sketches as more accurate. No one likes their faults being pointed out to them. And this is perhaps the most important tactic of psychics and fortune tellers. Tell people what they want to hear. The Barnum effect is just one reason why people might believe in those who claim to know our deepest personality traits or what awaits us in the future. But if we stay vigilant, we can spot when someone is trying to use this trick on us. Alright, that's enough of that. So, why are we talking about the Barnum effect? What's the connection here? A lot of it is context. So that's sort of the crux of this chapter. And when we're thinking about sort of QAnon, a lot of the belief in these conspiracy theories is that taking these sort of disjointed belief, beliefs that people have can, and then being offered a context that makes sense to them or helps them make sense of the world as it is. Remember when we talked about in chapter two about stagnant wages, precarity, insecurity, et cetera? Well, these influencers are able to come in take these individual statements, wrap them up in this conspiracy theory, and then make a lot of money peddling that to people as an explanation for what is actually going on to explain the problems in their life in a way that actually makes it so that they are the heroes, they are action heroes in this big spy novel. In much the same way that the Barnum effect plays on a lot of the same desired traits that we have as human beings. We want context. And we are particularly vulnerable to particular to the type of, of information. Oh, let's go. There we go. That context and information that makes us feel good. So if you take those individuals' points, and they, as you saw, when they gave people the same information but contextualized it differently, either having said that this is specifically about you or generally true of most people, people interpreted that information very differently because context is important. 
our brains crave it and we will fill it in and we will create context if we need it. And now complicating this, particularly in the context of the attention economy, is that we are inundated with far more information than we can ever meaningfully process. And if you ever sit and you try to contextualize that information, you might find out that that is an exercise in what we call futility. Let's take, for example, uh, my Twitter trends from the morning that I was first looking at this. Now, for, to, to give credit where moderate, small, minuscule credit is due, Twitter and some social, me and social media orgs have really been trying very hard to contextualize information it, it, to the extent that they can. They, they're not very good at it, let's be real. But in this case, I look at my trends and we've got Sneakerheads are sharing their wins and losses with Nike's latest draw in, in the sneakers app. Uh, Surfside, so there was the, the building collapse in Surfside, Florida. That was also trending. Um, Thursday vibes, tips, quotes, and stories to create a perfect Thursday vibe. There is no connection between these stories. And without the little blurb there, I would have no idea what any of this is. It's like whenever I wake up and I see that uh, Minecraft Twitter is trending, I have no idea what that means. So what is context really? And the context is an attempt to situate information in history. So if I look at Surfside, I can look at that and say, okay, there was a multi-story building collapse on Thursday in Surfside, Florida. That little blurb gives me some amount of information. And it's like, it, it provides a minuscule amount of context. But even with that effort, if you look at this snapshot and trends, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And if I think about, let's say like yesterday morning, Friday morning, let's say Friday morning, my Twitter feed was full of ongoing news because I have a lot of friends still in Florida, ongoing news about the Surfside building collapse. There was a, a popular VTubers uh, 3D debut. There was, there was, you know, normal drama and whatnot going on. And it's like throughout in the morning, it's like just, um, and obviously ironic shit posts from the podcasters that I follow, which means that if I were to just get up and look at this stream of information that is being, you know, sent at me like a fire hose, every time I open up my phone and look at my Twitter app, there's no real meaningful way to sort all of that information or to get any kind of context. And when we think about history and its connection to context, it's created out of, again, sustained and shared attention. So if I were to try to put this information in history, well, I'm looking at, you know, sneakers, right? The top trend here, that's going to be gone in an hour or two. How am I supposed to contextualize that information? connect it to other information and derive some kind of meaning out of that. It's just, it doesn't, it's not feasible on this platform. It's like when you wake up and there's a 3D debut trending, but then there's a Minecraft thing trending, and then there's uh, some kind of natural disaster. Then maybe there's some kind of resurgent MAGA trend. It's like, there's, it's just constantly shifting to try to keep track of and to be aware of all of the different forms and facets of information that are available through the internet. is just a, an exercise in futility. It's not possible because history isn't profitable. What's profitable is making sure that people keep refreshing. It's making sure there's new content there and new things to look at. And when you have new things to look at every time you check that out, well, that means there isn't a lot of time to really sit and let things marinate, even when they're major stories like Surfside. It's just, it's the business model of orgs like Facebook and Twitter. History doesn't make money. What makes money is, is clicks, engagement, and, refresh and refreshes. And the way to drive that is to constantly be pushing out new content. So there's been some other bits that I, I want to kind of push to. So now moving and pivoting away from history, I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the interpersonal consequences of the, the withdrawal from context that we exist within. So Goffman is a, a famous sociologist who came up with this term called dramaturgy, which is pretty, um, it sounds like a school of magic in a world of darkness game, I'm not going to lie. But one of the biggest things that Goffman pointed out was the, the dynamic of a front stage and a backstage. So to the front stage, you right now, you see the, uh, the beautiful, stunningly attractive uh, dear VTuber in front of you. The backstage, there is a depressed 30-year-old woman in her underwear. 
and you don't really need to see or be aware of the backstage. I have the front stage and that is what I choose to present to you. And importantly in Goffman's perceptions of dramaturgy, a person's identity is not fixed and is not stable. We play with roles, we present ourselves differently to different people depending on the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So when we think about this in terms of the attention economy, one of the bits that has been brought up and Odell brings up as well is that even though we have this sort of very natural front and backstage dynamic that has existed for a very long time, there's been a flattening of that in the attention economy. So we think about what is context. Context is history. Context is attention. Well, when everything that you do is just put out to everyone all the time, and increasingly social media companies are making it harder and harder to filter what, you're, what you are doing and what you present to different audiences, it gets harder and harder to manage your presentation as an, in an online self. And I think that this has really been very well evidenced with the bad faith weaponization of information out of context. In particular, I'm thinking about old tweets. So this gets brought up in particular in the book as an example of how this gets used against people. It's it's dunk culture, baby. So let's say you don't like somebody. Let's say you got beef with them. And you know what? They've been on Twitter for 10 years. You can probably find something beefy in there, something juicy in there. And how common is it for someone to go through and say, all right, well, I'm going to go try to make this person look bad. Well, what is the easiest way to do that? Well, it's to go through their old tweets, to find something objectionable, and then present it out of context to their existing audience, friends, family, etc., as evidence of the kind of person that they are in this one particular moment. I had this happen to a friend of mine a while back. He um, had a group of people that decided that they had it out for him and they wanted to present the image that he is racist in particular. And so after a great, I imagine a great deal of searching, one person in particular was able to find one tweet from something like 10 plus years ago and then spin it in the worst possible way and then spread it as widely and as prolifically as they could to try to push this narrative that my friend who made a tweet 10 years ago was racist in the present day based on this highly decontextualized and bad faith interpretation of what he had said. And this happens all the time because as we flattened history and talked about this transition to social media is also a transition away from, from context and history. Who you were 10 years ago might as well be who you are today. And there's an expectation that you should be your authentic self all the time. And that goes in tandem with the removal or the limitation of the ability for people to monitor and control their presentation in online spaces. Um, take, for example, this quote from Mark Zuckerberg. Um, you might know him as, as the founder of Facebook. There was a movie about him that is not entirely accurate, but has a pretty whipping soundtrack by Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails. Uh, let me take a, a quick drink here. Before, hopefully I won't spit this out. Uh, okay, Zuck if you fuck, everybody. Uh, or Zuck if you buck. One of those two. Hmm. The days of you having a different image for your work friends or coworkers and for the other people you know are probably coming to an end pretty quickly. Having two identities for yourself is an example of a lack of integrity. Um, so says the guy that founded his website based on rating the attractiveness of women in his school without their knowledge. He's a very high quality and very honorable dude. Hey, like two people can play this game. Two can play this game, Mark. But at the end of the day, this is not, I, I think this is terrible, but I don't think that it's unrealistic to say that it has become harder and harder to minimize your ability to control what you present in online spaces. And I'm pretty sure that, I wonder what Mark would say about VTubers, because according to that definition, I am definitely a black hole of integrity. These are all just from the last week, too. I've been a pirate. I've been a cat. I've been horny. <laughs> Uh, I'm just an absolute black hole of integrity. I do play Ramathal too. I'm just a monster. 
So considering that the attention economy doesn't easily make afford space for nuance and history, there are some personal consequences for that. So I talked about old tweets before, but the example that Odell gives in the book is the va vacation story. So in this example, classic sociological example coming from the, the school of dramaturgy, a student comes back from vacation and gives three different accounts to three different people about the story. They have a different story for their friends. They have a different story for their professor who asks them about it. And they have a different story for their parents. And that's very normal. And you're, if you're even now, if my parents ask me, well, what have you been doing lately? I, over the past year, I don't tell them I pretend to be a deer on the internet. They just don't need to know that. It's like when I talk to the people who only know me as a deer on the internet, I try to withhold the personal information that could potentially be used to identify me. Again, it's just VTuber culture. Sometimes. And yet, it is getting harder and harder to do that. So take, for example, um, this harrowing moment that I had. So take, take the, put yourself in my position. My antlers were a little bit shorter. I was a second year graduate student in my social psychology program. And I'm out at a conference. I'm meeting the students of my advisors, friends, and we're at this restaurant, we're at a happy hour. It's kind of the kitty table. And I know I've met most of them the year prior and drinks start flowing. We're all a little bit drunk. Some of us are more than a little bit drunk. And suddenly in front of everyone else at this table, people that I work with, people that I collaborate with, people that I put a lot of effort into keeping from finding out things about me. One of my colleagues leans across the table at me and says, Ricky, <clears throat> you know, how do you feel about being a part of the fighting game community, considering the stereotypes of people, you know? And my mind went blank. I'm sure I either went very red or looked paler than my VTuber. I don't, I didn't know how to respond. And I thought to myself, how the frick does this guy know this about me? We had never talked about it. And I asked him, like, what makes you like, what makes you think that I play fighting games? And he was like, oh, well, I had been posting in my local Facebook groups. And for no reason whatsoever, one day Facebook decided in this guy's timeline to show him that I had been to posting in those groups, despite the fact that he wasn't a member of them. He didn't even live in the same state. And so all that effort for me to try to control and regiment the information I presented to people, in particular, I didn't want the people that I collaborate with and I do research with to know what my hobbies are. And then that was taken from me by the algorithm. It's one of the major reasons I stopped using Facebook was because it just became impossible to cultivate the information, one, that I was seeing, and two, that I was showing. It was a real scary moment for me. Here I was in a professional environment and all of a sudden being grilled about my hobbies. Hobbies that I'd gone out of my way to keep people from finding out about. Hecked up! So there's this concept that gets thrown around a lot. Um, it was initially first like Antoine Augustin uh, Corat uh, in 1861 coined the term the end of history to refer to um, a point in which civil society will achieve perfection. And that same term was later on resurrected and revised by postmodern theorists to refer to the end of a linear history into an all-encompassing modernity. This gets brought up a lot about around conversations of neoliberalism as well, where we've kind of like sort of in the uh, the, the post civil rights, uh, post Vietnam era, again mostly post Reagan, post Thatcher. It's supposed to basically say, like, we've hit this point where, you know, everything is always going to be the same. We've hit this homeostasis status quo of society where nothing is ever meaningfully going to change. It's going to, that's just how it works, right? So, in a way, I think social media has, and the attention economy, in trying to shovel information to people, depriving it of context and its attachment to history, it's facilitated the end of history. We exist now in a moment, at least in so far as social media is concerned, 
where we have collapsed into an all-encompassing present. You, as you are now, 10 to 12, 13 years after you made that tweet, are considered to be and expected by some to be exactly the same person that made it in the first place. And what this does is if you want to bring back that I thou and I it dichotomy, we have this idea of I thou. Remember, I thou is contextualized, it is effortful, it is understanding something as separate than you and not necessarily as having to have a direct utility to you. I it is sort of the blinders on, devoid of context, what is this thing and what can I get from it? By collapsing history into this point where everything is just sort of happening all the time and everyone is responsible for everything that they've ever said, we've really pushed into a, a state of I it that is enduring and I think not great, not great for anyone. So what can we do to reestablish context in a, sense, in a sense of space? Well, Odell comes back to the same kind of the, uh, the, the trusty line here of the idea of responsible attention. And that is to say that what we need to do is be critical consumers and try to learn to care about each other in the spaces that we live in. So Odell keeps bringing up these tree metaphors, particularly looking at stuff like gentrification and, cons and biological conservation as parallels to ways to exist within the attention economy. What we need to do is understand that we are part of a broader social tapestry and care about the people that co-inhabit that space with us. And that includes both physical and temporal space. So, and I would also say virtual space as well because I'm obligated to because as a VTuber I only exist within virtual space. Taking control and taking the reins back in resisting the attention economy as a means of trying to develop empathy and to work to develop lasting relationships with the people around us is one way that we can try to reestablish context and break out of the end of history that it seems like we are rapidly careening towards. So reestablishing context and, and yeah, understanding and contextualizing relationships. And that is hard. That is hard. It goes along with the existential fear of being perceived. And, you know, undoubtedly, at some point, you might encounter people that have a motivation to perceive you in the worst possible way. But taking that risk is part of trying to reestablish that space. To participate in community is to also be trusting of those communities and trust that people are going to try to take care of you and try to trust and take you in good faith. So that's really what Odell kind of boils down there at on so uh, uh, re-picking back up here on the conclusion of the book. So Odell believes that we are living under the threat of a looming monoculture, which I think there is um, there's some there's some truth to. Every, it seems like every couple of months, the Disney Corporation pulls in another new major batch of IPs. And by and large, what, three different media companies control basically all of film, movies, and television. And increasingly, we also see the same thing around social media where giants are sitting down and basically consuming smaller companies and by and also in order to meet the expectations of their investors are gradually all becoming the same thing. I mean, remember fleets? Fleets and Twitter, which are basically Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, they're all gradually just becoming the same thing. Facebook statuses became tweets. Um, everything is just kind of careening toward this th like this piece where, in the inter pursuit of profit and cap and and capital, we are gradually bringing ourselves toward a spot of of monoculture. I, I agree, Mercury. I think we should we need to go back to my we have to go back to my space. That's the only way to really do nothing. Let's see, uh, I also lost my slides there for a second. There we go. So one of the bits that. Odell brings up, and it's actually the title of the conclusion to the book, is Manifest Dismantling. It's a cool term, right? Manifest Dismantling. It sounds a lot like Manifest Destiny, right? So for those of you who might not remember or maybe aren't part or maybe aren't even in the United States, there is a term that we throw around called Manifest Destiny, which was a, a, a galvanizing signifier of the push westward in a colonial expansion in the United States, wherein settlers drove out westward when there was a real idea that this was uh, 
they had a responsibility to break the land. They had to settle it. They had to colonize it. They had to plow the fields. And any people, places, animals, or things that were there were in the pro really in the way of this grand visionary project. It sucks. And it has caused tremendous ecological, sociological, even psychological damage in the history of this country. And one of the examples, again, that Odell comes up with that I really like is a dam. So part of Manifest Destiny, I mean, what's a, what's a better image of Manifest Destiny than a dam, right? You have a river, that river has been there for centuries. And all of a sudden you come in, you redirect it, you build a dam. And in time, as settlements shift and all that, maybe that dam isn't even necessarily useful anymore. And so that was the, one of the cases that Odell writes about. There's a dam, it is no longer necessarily very useful. And so there's a decision made about what, what are, they have to make kind of a decision and as a community, what are they gonna do about the dam? And one example is just to blow it up, destroy it and move on. But there's a harder process, which is to redirect the river back, to slowly deconstruct the dam, to be cautious and careful, to make sure to minimize ecological impact of the deconstruction of this dam that had a tremendous impact on the ecosystem already. So if you ever watch the end of the movie Fight Club, um, I'm going to spoil it for you. So basically at the end of Fight Club, Project Mayhem blows up all the credit card buildings, destroys their servers, and destroys all credit card debt with the explicit goal of trying to revert humanity to the state of a hunter-gatherer society. It's, uh, it's an interesting movie um, that I think a lot of people miss the point of. Maybe that would be a fun film series to talk about Fight Club. But comparing it to the dam example, I think this is a good visual. When we think about the attention economy, what, what, is, what is there to do? There's a very good line at the end of the preceding chapter where Odell talks about what are you supposed to do with this information? You've read this book at this point, and if you really even go through this reading series, we've talked about the exploitation of labor. We've talked about emotional manipulation. We've talked about stagnant wages. We've talked about the ways that you are constantly being, your autonomy and ability to connect with people is being undermined every minute of every day. So what do you do with that information now that you have it? And one answer is you just get angry. And if you really think about it, you'll just be angry all the time. But in the conclusion, Odell points out that destruction really isn't the goal of manifest dismantling. The goal is to replace it with something else, not just to destroy what is there, and to do so in a way that contributes to a net positive or a net good. It's a long and it's an effortful process, but we can't simply escape the pitfalls of the attention economy by just logging off. You know, we've talked about that before, right? You know, I'm just, you can't just walk off into the woods because if the, the premise of the attention economy is built and predicated on really sitting down and individuating people and focusing on privatization and individual autonomy, well, Walking away is still an individual choice. It doesn't actually really re rebuke the the core beliefs or core tenets of, of the attention economy. If you want to really get escape from it, if you really want to resist it, it's a longer, it's a more difficult, and it's a more effortful process. Because after all, the attention economy is itself a complex beast. It's an intersection of capitalism, media, and even very well-paid psychologists doing experiments to figure out how they can best get you to roll on the gotcha again. And we're perpetually being run through a machine that is stripping us of context and connection and making profit off us. You know, what, what, what ability do we really have to do anything? Odell's very actually hesitant to actually answer the tenant of the, of the book. How do you do nothing? But what it really boils down to is not falling into despair and not giving in to escapism. Remember, we talked about the communes in chapter two, but rather staying and trying to make effortful connections with people in whatever way, in whatever medium you can. Seeking out context, trying to really learn about people, 
and trying to understand them on their own terms, you know, pulling again back to that I it and I thou perspective. We can expand our attention outward to the world around us. You know, there was a, a moment that I had as I was thinking about how to really end the series with my with my girlfriend last night. So she she took me out to the forest reserve that's near her apartment at sunset when the fireflies were coming out. And she said something that really stuck with me. And it took me a while and kind of, I think just now recently really started to make sense to me, which is that she likes coming out and watching the fireflies because she knows that even if she wasn't there, they would still be there. They aren't contingent on her presence or awareness. And what I take away from that, maybe I can ask her after the stream to explain herself more thoroughly, is that going out and observing the fireflies, watching them play in the bushes and everything, is a deliberate choice that you have to make. They're going to be there regardless because they exist apart from you. And you have to make the deliberate choice to become part of that experience with those fireflies it's exactly what odell talks about with being mindful and extending your awareness remember we talked about deep listening in chapter one where you have to make the conscious choice to extend your awareness and attention outward to the world around you in a way that contextualizes you as a part of a world that does exist outside of your awareness and perception of it and in that we can aim to pursue and find context as ways of illuminating and, and enriching our own human experience. It's, uh, it's hard. It's difficult. We have to really exert a lot of effort to do so. Um, even at multiple junctions, I've talked about this attention is a finite resource, and Adele talks about it, but it's a thing that gets easier over time. It's hard to direct your attention away from the attention economy at times. If you're like me, even sometimes, you know, going a couple days outside of Twitter can be stressful because after all, I, I'm a virtual deer that doesn't exist outside of my ability to create content. But over time, it gets easier. And I think that's the big part here is that it's not to look for easy answers, but to really resist the attention economy is to change the way that you relate to media and also to change the way that you relate to the world and the people around you. It's to stretch and flex and, and build up your attention in a way that allows you to pursue and understand history and context and really also build up empathy. It's to make effortful and rich connections with the people around you outside of just what you can get from them. That's what it really means to resist the attention economy. That's how you do nothing. But um, in fewer words and less dramatic words, you can just go touch grass. Just go outside, roll in it. There's a lot of it. It's free. It's free. You can just touch it. It's not illegal. <laughs> so it's the, the biggest kusa I will ever get on this stream. Go out and understand the grass.